Welcome to module 2.1, SARS-CoV-2 sequencing in Arizona. This presentation is part of the COVID-19 Genomic Epidemiology Toolkit from CDC's Office of Advanced Molecular Detection. My name is Haley Yaglum, and I work at the Translational Genomics Research Institute in Arizona as a genomic epidemiologist. This toolkit is the first of three case studies that will provide insight into how whole genome sequencing can be used as an investigative tool in outbreak settings. Be sure to check out the toolkit's other modules, which include an introduction to genomic sequencing and training materials to help you and your team start using genome sequence data to supplement your epidemiologic investigations. TGen North and Flagstaff is home to our pathogen and microbiome division, where we have a 13-year history of applying genomics to clinical medicine and public health. Before joining TGen North, I was an infectious disease epidemiologist at the Arizona Department of Health Services, where shoe leather disease surveillance was part of my everyday job. In this module, I will be sharing our use of sequencing SARS-CoV-2 to understand the genomic epidemiology of COVID-19 in Arizona. To visualize our story, we are using NextStrain, which is an online interactive platform used to display and track pathogen genome data. The circles shown here on this map indicate the country or state of origin for the SARS-CoV-2 genomes we have used in our analyses. There are only a subset of all available genomes from around the world. North American genomes are highlighted in red, as you can see. And since we are mostly concerned with Arizona cases, the circle representing Arizona genomes is the largest. Like other states, Arizona has reported many COVID-19 cases, more than 450,000 since the beginning of the pandemic. We have also sequenced and analyzed more than 5,000 SARS-CoV-2 genomes, making Arizona's sequencing effort one of the most extensive in the nation. Sequence data help us map transmission of the virus within and among Arizona communities and study mutations for their potential to cause increased transmission or virulence. Genomic information can alert public health to super spreader events, hotspots of local spread, and clusters of disease. It can also help identify introductions of new SARS-CoV-2 strains into the region and point to possible sources of infection. By comparing SARS-CoV-2 genomes sequenced in Arizona to others from around the world, we have learned a lot about COVID-19 in Arizona. First, the virus came into the state from several different places, as demonstrated by this phylogenetic tree, which shows how different strains of the virus from around the world are related, much like a family tree. The colored dots you see, called leaf nodes, represent sequences from the 15 counties in Arizona. The white and gray dots represent other sequences obtained from around the world. The strains that are now circulating in Arizona are closely related to strains from many other countries and US states. Let's take a closer look at some examples in next strain by clicking on the box at the top right. Our current view is displaying samples over time by their collection date which is shown here on the x-axis. I use this view for navigation purposes, and it's helpful when we wanna look at the evolution of pathogens over time. You can also explore the data in NextStrain. In this view, you can search for specific samples or strains using the box on the left-hand side of the screen. If you wanna search for samples from Germany, for example, I type in the country name, and you can see a few of the darker gray leaf nodes are highlighted. Now I'm gonna zoom in on the top portion of the tree. As I pass over the leaf nodes, which represent viral genomes from COVID-19 cases, metadata for each case is displayed. In bioinformatics, any data other than genomic data are typically referred to as metadata. The metadata shown here include collection date and location of original sample. I'm now going to switch to the divergence view of the phylogenetic tree. 
In this view, in contrast to the time view, the x-axis indicates the number of mutations by which individual sequences differ from each other. I will point out that Arizona sequences are related to others from Washington, California, New York, and Louisiana. In fact, some Arizona sequences, the ones with the colored leaf nodes on this main branch at the top, are identical to others collected in April from Louisiana, providing evidence of the spread of SARS-CoV-2 after Mardi Gras. By analyzing our phylogenetic trees closely, we can infer that the virus was introduced into Arizona at least 12 times during the early part of the pandemic, and that the first introductions resulting in community transmission occurred in mid to late February. When I reset the layout to view the entire tree, you can see that several lineages are present in our Arizona samples. In some areas of the tree, we see a limited number of introductions into these counties, the yellow, blue, and orange sections, followed by community transmission. In the lower portion of the tree, where there are multiple colors, it's more likely that multiple introductions occurred, mostly via domestic travel. Lastly, at the very bottom of the tree, you can see samples from Wuhan, China, highlighted in red, The next image is going to zoom in on this section of the global tree. One of the very first cases of COVID-19 in the US was identified in Arizona on January 22nd, when a 26 year old man presented to a health clinic reporting a two day history of non-productive cough. He had recently returned from Wuhan City, China and reported having contact with a person with cough and fever while traveling. Rapid public health response efforts, including quarantine, testing, and contact tracing, helped to prevent further transmission from this initial case. Genomic analysis shows this virus strain, highlighted in blue, is closely related to others from Asia, pointing to its origin. In the background, you can see the faint red lines from the previous slide. The most important result of this analysis is that we don't see any more viruses in Arizona related to this one, supporting the epidemiologic evidence that spread from this case was stopped. The, this example shows how sequencing used in tandem with contact tracing and epidemiologic information can document successful public health interventions. On March 26th, just three weeks after community transmission had been identified by public health investigators, the Arizona Department of Health Services declared COVID-19 to be widespread with 12 of the 15 counties in the state reporting cases. This map shows that by that date, we had sequenced genomes from COVID-19 cases from all 12 counties, allowing us to use genomic information to help tell the story and retrospectively assess the impact of early public health efforts. Now I'm going to dive into a few Arizona stories that demonstrate how rapid genomic analyses can provide a better understanding of pathogen transmission patterns and help guide public health response efforts. In mid-May, local public health officials responded to an outbreak of COVID-19 among staff and residents of a multi-residential group home setting that provides care for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Samples were collected at 16 of the homes. In four of the homes, all residents tested positive, and in the remaining 12 houses where samples were collected, all residents tested negative. This tree displays in yellow the genomes that we were able to sequence from this outbreak. It shows that they are closely related to each other, which you can see here by the very small number of mutations separating them. In fact, the 11 samples on this main branch are identical to each other. This genomic data correlates with epidemiologic information and suggests that an infected staff member introduced SARS-CoV-2 into this setting. Staff typically interacted with residents from multiple homes until SARS-CoV-2 was detected, when management responded by restricting movement of staff between homes to care for residents. Through our sequencing of samples collected from COVID-19 cases in the same region of Arizona, 
we learned that this outbreak was not limited to the group home and that some community transmission of this strain also occurred. The enhanced precautions and infection control measures taken by staff and timely intervention by public health officials likely curbed this outbreak. We have also been working closely with one of Arizona's Native American communities, which was hit hard by COVID-19. This tribal community has experienced high infection rates, but very low mortality, due in part to successful on the ground interventions by public health staff and community health workers, including rapid contact tracing, testing, and prompt clinical management. Early on, evidence pointed to four independent clusters of COVID-19 occurring in this tribal community. However, our genomic analyses showed that cases associated with these clusters stemmed from a single transmission chain. The tribe's index case was a healthcare worker who had recently traveled to Phoenix and experienced an onset of fever and cough on March 25th, but continued to work. Genomic analysis shows that this case seeded an outbreak on this reservation with cases comprising the clade colored in pink. This clade or group of closely related strains is defined by an amino acid change in the spike protein H245Y. A second clade colored in purple contains another group of cases in this tribal community. Sequences in this group are defined by a second unique mutation, R209I. Let's explore this pink clade further. I am now highlighting the earliest sample collected from the index case on March 29th. All cases identified in this tribal community in April, and most of those identified in May, make up this clade, demonstrating the rapid spread of a single clone. This figure summarizes data from the epidemiologic investigation of this outbreak. The index case labeled A1 had five household contacts, all of whom became symptomatic and tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. More extensive contact tracing was conducted, finding two coworkers living in households C and E, both developed mild symptoms and tested positive. In an attempt to protect them from infection by adults in their household, three asymptomatic children from household C were sent to live in household D. In time, the three children from household C and the eight members of household D all tested positive for SARS-CoV-2, suggesting that asymptomatic children had spread infection to household D. This turned out to be a common occurrence, providing valuable public health insight into the outbreak dynamics in this unique community. In fact, Frequent interactions amongst community and family members living near each other likely played a role in widespread transmission of the virus later observed in this community. Results of this analysis were crucial for understanding that continuous travel off the reservation was not responsible for spreading SARS-CoV-2 in this area. Instead, it focused attention on working with tribal community to interrupt transmission. The phylogenetic analysis of this cluster correlates well with the series of events uncovered in the epidemiologic investigation I just presented. Although isolation efforts were successful in limiting spread within and among these households, our genomic analysis also revealed that the initial case gave rise to a larger outbreak in the tribal community. This indicates that despite rapid, efficient contact tracing and isolation directives from public health officials, community transmission was not stopped. I want to emphasize that our genomic data were not complete, as only some of the known cases were available for sequencing, and the known cases probably represent only a fraction of all infections that occurred. These stories from Arizona highlight the value of genomic epidemiology in public health practice. We are fortunate to have so many Arizona genomes as seen in red on this tree to help us gain a more detailed picture of COVID-19 in our state. 
Although we can tell so much more of the epidemiologic story with genomics, it is important to point out some limitations. First, as I mentioned in the last example, we need to remember that we are only subsampling the virus population by analyzing the sequence data from a subset of infections. Other cases not included in our genomic analyses could have been played an important role in transmission. Second, just because two samples are identical doesn't mean that there weren't intermediate transmission events, such as other people, connecting two cases. Genomic and epidemiologic information must be considered together when interpreting findings, formalizing conclusions, and implementing actions. As a former epidemiologist with the Arizona Department of Health Services, I have truly learned the value of these new technologies and how they can significantly advance the state of infectious disease surveillance and public health response. Beyond COVID-19, genomic surveillance has the potential to identify dis infectious disease clusters with greater speed and accuracy and at earlier time points to help trigger and guide a more informed and effective public health response. The link to Arizona's full next string narrative as well as the condensed version I presented here, will be available in the COVID-19 Genomic Epidemiology Toolkit. As you explore the data with your team, I hope you find ways to include genomic epidemiology in your public health practice, and maybe even become as passionate about it as I have. This concludes module 2.1. The next module will review two separate outbreaks at long-term care settings and how sequencing helped clarify the pattern of transmission in these settings please visit the COVID-19 Genomic Epidemiology Toolkit page where you can find further reading on this topic. On the toolkit page, you can also subscribe to our mailing list and receive announcements as new modules and materials are released. Thank you for watching.